Okay. So begin by specifying the three components of the adapter pattern and the role that each plays. Okay, so we'll talk about like the client. The client, this is what, remember we talked about the client, it, it, sometimes we use client to describe, we said like it could be the terminal when we make like a curl request to like get, you know, google.com or something like that. I have to do this, port 80. Um, but the client is just whatever makes the request uh, to a server, or to an API. Um, so it could be your browser is the client when you go visit a website. In this case, we write like a class, right? The, the client is actually code, where we can call it like our you know, Foursquare client or something like that, right? And we can call like make request and maybe pass through some uh, params and it's going to uh, like make the get request, right? And then pass through the params as an argument. Okay, so this would, these params would be like, you know, it could be like the location or whatever of the venue. And then maybe here is the location. Right, and then this is, what is it? This is a four square URL. So the idea of the client is that it holds a lot of inform. It, its purpose is it makes the request to an external API. Right. Notice that I'm using this uh, language of requests and responses. This is something that I saw like people not doing fully or as much as they could. Right. Is maybe using alternative words, but th this is what it's doing. Right. Where literally you can see it in the code. Right. Making a GET request. Right, retrieving data by making a GET request to an external API. Uh, I would say like, you know, um, contains knowledge about, you could say all, like, all yeah, contains knowledge about that, the external API, including endpoints, parameters, uh, and references, uh, authorization or authentication. Right, like this is, you can kind of see that, like this allows me. I'm just, it's just a couple of sentences, but it, I feel like I get a, like in an interview, I'd get a good amount of points. Like people can see I'm not just fudging it. Like I have a pretty good understanding of what. Here's the top line. What does it do? Cool. It makes requests to an external API, and then I expand upon that a little bit more. So the client it contains knowledge, meaning you know, it, like if you look at the content of the code, this has like again about the external API and then I expand upon it this means like the endpoints right the URLs any parameters it takes in you can see that um, and our like any authentication right and we saw that right that you could have maybe like the client ID maybe maybe you like import from settings do like settings dot client ID or something like that. And then the client secret. Uh, or you know you can go from settings import. Either way, it's fine. You do something like that. Right, and then here, this is the URL, and then sometimes, so sometimes you'll have write this as like the root URL, and that would be, you know, foursquare.com. Right, uh, and then you can just reference that here. Okay, so right, we call this the client. It, it I remember someone, you know, was brought up before. You know, should we call this like the name of the API? Uh, right, and the answer is yes. Like if you look at the information it has, everything here is particular to the Foursquare API. Right, this is not generic information. The client ID, client, this is how we log in to Foursquare. This is the URL of Foursquare. This is location, you know, makes sense with Foursquare. It does not make sense with Spotify, I don't think. 
but so you can see like everything here is about Foursquare. So it actually like it's almost like if you look at this and you kind of write the title, yeah, I'd say this this lines up. Um, so that's the client the adapter. I felt like you generally have the gist of it, right? Um, uh, of what the adapter does. This uh, the adapter takes uh, JSON data from the client and transforms it into instances. Uh, and I might expand with an example. For example, you know, with Foursquare, we may take a dictionary and from there both reduce the data, right? Meaning like select attributes and coerce the data. So this is kind of like a trick is like, I guess, if maybe it's hard for you to kind of say up front exactly what's going on, give yourself an example and then you can summarize what it does. So then we can just say like, so, right? Now that I remember, so the adapter, both, you know, uh, uh, both core, both reduces the data or like selects specific attributes, relevant attributes, coerces our data, and transforms, say like, yeah, it transforms our data into instances. Right, this is really like where the bulk of the work is happening, I'd say, with the adapter. Uh, I mean, we could, you know, this is also oftentimes where we're saving it, right? We do something. Uh, did I write it out before? Where class, if we call this Foursquare adapter, right? Then, you know, def init self, let's say this venue attributes. Uh, you pass this through self dot this is a dictionary by the way. Right, and then we have like this run method. And then the run method calls like uh, self dot select attributes, right? So first we just select the relevant data that we need because generally what we get is like a dictionary that has like so many keys that we don't need. Just and so we just need a couple of them. So we do this like select the attributes method. Where what we'll do is like take the dictionary. We if you want you could pass through the dictionary here. And then say like okay, for k comma v in venue attributes dot items uh Right, because this is a dictionary. And it will say, uh, probably just do a dictionary comprehension, k colon v, uh, if k is in some sort of list of attributes, right? Where maybe this is like the ID and the, you know, zip code or whatever, the name, the price, right? And return this. And then finally, so we get this venue. This is like selected venue attributes. And then we turn this into an inst, you know, maybe we coerce the data from here. Like maybe there's certain things we need to change to be numeric or whatever. So we'll, just put, we'll just put coerce data if we need to. And then finally, we want to take this and turn it into an instance. So you write, somehow pass through the dictionary however we do it, and, and turn this into an instance, and then probably save it, something like that, right? And maybe we do this, right? So Will, William was asking, like, we could loop through our data, right? We could loop through each of our dictionaries and call run on each dictionary, right? For each dictionary, right? Like, take it and blah, blah, blah. I, I do like that just because now we can just like, cool, here's a dictionary I want to coerce. Take, you know, we don't need a list. Just take it and, and call run and it will turn it into an instance for us. So this is our adapter. 
essentially, right? Save it. It's pretty good. Um, right, and it makes sense. It's like a wall adapter, right? It, it, an adapter fits one thing into the other, and that's what this does. We get this messy thing. It shaves it down so that it fits into our model, and then we can save it in our database, right? It kind of, it's like feels like the right term to me. Uh, so you know, re I'll will send you this uh, so you can reread this about what it does, uh, and then what next? And the model, right? The model. The model is the last thing. Yeah, go ahead, Pally. Uh, what words normally use is the ETL use it's or both. Not, honestly, it's both. So maybe ETL is a little bit more common. I say this is if you say the adapter pattern. I don't know. Uh, you could say ETL. I say the adapter pattern is specifying a specific way to load data. Some people will say ETL, and then everything's just done in one file and like not even done in like using classes. The adapter pattern is the, is using like a client and adapter and a model. Like that's that's kind of how it's defined. If someone uses ETL, then it's not. Relevant to say about the, about the adapter thing, right? I'd say, this is, have... I'd say this is one way to implement okay. the adapter pattern, and it's like you want to be able to justify it. You want it like for me to say, okay, it's the preferred way. It's preferred to me. <laughs> like I, I think I think the, you know you can go to a team and they'll be like, well, why? And, and so you should be able to answer it, right? Saying, well, because that's what I was told is not helpful. Um, so. Okay, so we'll get to that, right? Like, why do I think this is useful, right? All right, let's do the model layer. So again, like ETL is kind of a little bit more generic, I would say, right? You can write, you can, people will say like ETL and just have like an ETL, like one file that doesn't use classes or anything. And like somehow they perform these steps of like selecting the data, coercing it, loading it into the database. And just to, you know, right, how does this line up? Well, this is extracting, right? Pulling the data, right, from an API. Transforming the data, obviously, is the adapter. And then loading it is kind of when we do save, right? Saving it. But to transform it into an instance, right, that's our model. Uh, so what is the model? The model uh, is a class that represent that is closely aligned to a specific I would say a model to a specific table in a database and I think you all know this like I think if I pushed you on it you will, like this is nothing new to any of you with the row um, being aligned to an instance be, or we could say being represented but you can see why it's like a useful exercise to write this out because the more you write this out, the easier it's going to be to speak about it. You know, like I listen to like this podcast uh, network, The Ringer. It's like a, just like a sports and entertainment. And they're like, why? They're like, you make no money from your website. Why do you keep having people write blogs? And they're like, well, we are representing our thoughts on, you know, on paper first. Right. And then we can speak about it. And it's the same thing. Like I write, you know, it's a lot easier for me to lecture because I've written the curriculum. Like I've taken the time to think through this. So, you know, that's my argument for doing this. So, okay, it's closely aligned to a specific table in the database with a row being represented uh, as an instance and a table being represented as a class. The model is part of the data layer in an application. Something like that. Um, and then we know how to do a, a model. Okay, so why okay, why do we have the adapter pattern? So this okay, so these types of questions, I think these are very good like thought experiments that you should kind of always do is just like okay, if we don't have forget it okay, well now we never learn the adapter pattern. is my life any harder without of it? Without it. So I'd say this is the main thing. The adapter pattern encourages us to clean, right? Like meaning like coerce into the correct data type. 
right, and validate our data before it enters our database. I'd also add like probably validate and standardize, meaning uh, you know all of our instances of a venue look the same before it enters our database. Uh, and you can say, uh, you know, because of this, we can assume once our data is in our database, we can assume that certain standards are met. Right? This is like any kind of like factory type work. Like if you like think about like orange juice, like we, right, we buy it from a brand. Once it's like, you know, we buy our Tropicana, like it's got Tropicana on the label. Once it's like in the shelves, like we assume that, hey, everything is like, this is, these are made by real oranges, hopefully. And like, this is like good, we can drink this, right? This is the same exact idea, right? This is like probably taken from manufacturing or right? an idea as old as time that like, all right, we're enforcing certain standards and then we can just rely on it as opposed to, you think about if we didn't have it this way, using that analogy, we would have to, every time we buy, you know, orange juice off the shelf, we'd have to like check and, and personally inspect it. It's the same thing here. Like if we don't clean it up front, we're going to be fighting with this dirty data, right, throughout the rest of our code base. Oh crap, it has way too many attributes on it that we don't have to worry about it. We're going to be dealing with that all around our code. So the idea is right when we make a request, the next thing we do is transform it and then load it into our database. And then we know that it's just exactly what we need in the right format. And it's going to be easier for us to work with. Right. And then the other thing is, remember, I said that it standardizes our data. By this, I mean, say we pull data from, you know, we get data from Foursquare, we get data from Yelp. These are both venues. So even though they may you know, be called, it could be called like name for Foursquare and location name for Yelp, we want to standardize it so that, you know, we can work with the data more easily, um, right? Like you can kind of see applications of that. So you can imagine we're pulling down venue data from like 20 different APIs. We want to standardize it so that then we can really compare like to like and, and, and work with this data. All right, quite, like think through like conceptually, I guess, like I think this is the main question. Like, why do we have the adapter pattern? I mean, you can then go more detailed into it, like why we have a client, like why do we have a separate client? Well, this just holds, there's like actually a good amount of specific information here, just about Foursquare. If we have a different API like Yelp, we're just going to have the equivalent information, but about Yelp. So it makes sense that, I don't know, that th this, is, this is my tool, right? This is just a tool for easily querying an API. That's what it is, right? The client just allows me to easily query an API. The adapter transforms the data from one, uh, from like a dictionary to an instance and cleans it. The model is how we, you know, how we relate this data, this Python data type, this instance to a row in the database, how we, you know, save it in the database, how we retrieve it from the database, right? Like that's the, the, the model is like part of our data layer, but how we represent kind of data in Python. Um, yeah. Qu questions about this. So I, I think you might be getting to it later, but the model in ETL and the model in MVC they're basically the same they thing. They are the same thing. We're not writing anything. They, they are the same thing. Exactly the same. Like, there's no new code, really, that you write. And that's part of it. It's like, if you look at the model, right? If you look at the model, like, say we have a class venue, you know, and maybe we have some init, right? We have, you know, our columns or whatever we do. The columns table right and then we uh, have our relations that venue maybe has many categories 
mean, take a, if you look at this model, like where does it say the word Foursquare or anything about Foursquare, right? Like this data could be coming from Foursquare, it could be coming from Yelp, it could be coming from a CSV file, right? So that's very useful, right? Because it's like when you're looking at this model, you're not, you don't care. Like you as a developer, you don't care where the data came from. It, you, you are relying on the fact that it is, you know, reliable data, that this is what, you, you know, this is your list of venues, right? Why do you care wh where it came from, really? If you need to look at where it came from, you should be able to eventually trace it back. But for right now, this is what you care about. Give me a venue. All right, I want to ask a question about who are its categories, what's the most, you know, profitable venue, right? Like, those are the things you want to worry about. If you care about, you know, the API stuff, great. We'll go to a different part to answer questions about this. So like really these design patterns are very much about like when I'm dealing with a problem, I just want to like code is hard enough. I just want the code relevant to what I'm thinking about in front of my face. Like, cool. I'm dealing with a venue. This is everything I can, I need to know about a venue. Like, right. Like the table and columns, it makes sense that they're in this class because we just said a, a model is closely related to uh, the table, the underlying table. So this tells me, here's the table, here's the columns, right? Here's the relations relevant to this thing. Like this is like everything we need to know about it. That's the idea. It's like, like clicking on the, like a Wikipedia article or the first paragraph of a Wikipedia article about what a venue is, what it does. Um, so we pass everything or we save everything through an LRM. Yeah, so the, like when we call the save method Right. If you think about what like our ORM, right, so ORM, right, stands for Object Relational Mapper. Just to quickly review this, right. And basically, this when they say object, we know what that is. That's the instance, like a venue instance. When they say relational, like they mean table, right? Like the database layer. Okay. So they mean like the table, the rows, and the table. The mapper means one to the other, right? Mapping one to the other. So yeah, like this save method right, applies to that because it takes our instance and turns it into right, a row. The build from record method right, does the same. It does the inverse, right? Takes a, a record in the database, turns it into an instance. And so, yeah, we're, we're like importing it from an outside class or file. We're not doing it in any of these Correct. parts of the... Correct. And in real life, like we wrote this from scratch. In real life, it would really be like from SQL Alchemy. Like that's probably what your ORM would be. We didn't learn it because then you'd forget about SQL. But this is what most people would ultimately use. And it uses a bunch of methods very similar to what we've built. So this is all related to the SQL thing. But if, what if the data is no SQL, then this these models are not going to affect it, right? I mean, you can, it depends on the pattern. Like if you still want methods, lots of times you would, you would still employ this, to be honest. You would still, like even in JavaScript, for example, right, like where maybe you use like Mongo. Like, yeah. yeah, you would, you would still, lots of times if you want methods, it's like the same thing. It's not like, would you employ this? It's, you, you want to ask yourself, I mean, to get to answer that question, I would say you want to think through if I had no SQL, like if I just have a dictionary, essentially, like is it useful to have like a model? And I would say yes, because it's like, well, related to this venue, there are specific methods, right? I still might want to employ, right? That's like why models help us. It's like, oh yeah, it's basically just a file. It's like, all right, this venue has certain methods, like categories that say another class is totally irrelevant. Right to say um, class like zip code. Right, this is something else I'll probably that is would eventually be in our Foursquare database. But to do def categories, that doesn't make what's that? What is a category of a zip code? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So it's the same thing. When I'm thinking about a venue. This categories method makes a lot of sense to care about. When I'm thinking about a zip code, I don't want to see the word categories. That's not relevant to me. Right. So the same use case. I would say applies, right? Representing our data, the, this model is like associating uh, methods with managing our data, giving us kind of like, here's what you care about when you look at a venue.
Did that help, Pally? Yeah, that that that's actually uh, really helped because I was thinking like if if we have a MongoDB data that is like mostly dictionary, then why we need an ORM? But now it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's exactly the right kind of question. It's like, are, like I like those questions because it really pushes you to think like when is this useful? What's the real value of this? Right? Yeah. Cool. Other questions about the adapter pattern? I mean, these are these are really good. And we, you know, like I did just speak to like an employer that was like, why, like, why use this thing? You know, and I had to make the case. I was like, this is why I think like people should use it. Like, I don't get why they wouldn't, you know. And but I, I'm just saying, I, I think my point for bringing that up is, if you don't understand the reasoning for it, then to other people this won't look, this won't necessarily look like a benefit, right? And maybe it's not, you know, and maybe you reach some compromise or maybe they make a counter argument that says somehow it's not necessary right i don't know so that's why i'm like the you know the justification is very valuable like it seems if you think about it like an engineer it seems like you're going to constantly have to justify your you know the the choices that you make okay so moving on, what plays the role? The view and MVC. So in our case, it's, I know that I say not to use one words, but uh, this is kind of it. It's like the HTML and JSON. This is, and now I guess I can expand upon it. This is what the, uh, re, uh, what I call it, the client? Yeah, kind of the client, right? Because now, in this case, someone's, someone's making a request like a browser is making a request to our API, right? Our MVC, like our Flask application is an API, right? You make a request to it, it gives us back JSON. So this is what the client uh, receives, uh, is returned after making its request, right? Uh, so, you know, in the case of going to a website like ESPN, we get back HTML. We are making a request, and what do we get back? We get back this view layer. It has to like query the database and like somehow combine, you know, figure out the player's first name from the database and pull it out and embed it in the HTML so that we see, you know, this player's name and the relevant pictures. But uh, yeah, all we get back is like, you know, the name of the player and, and some pictures with him. And so what's returned to us is the HTML or the JSON. This is what the client. Uh, is returned or we would say uh, this is what maybe uh, the server response sends back I like this better as a response to the client's request All right typically this is either HTML in the case of a website, like a, uh, a web application, or a JSON in the case of an API. What is the roller? OK, so here, this I, I did not, here I feel like people needed help a little bit. What is the role of the controller? It, like what is the controller primarily re concerned with? The answer here is really requests and responses. The controller um, receives requests, right? Like you can from the client and uh, sends back a response in the form of HTML or JSON. So like requests and responses really should be kind of like the keywords when you think about a controller, right? Like it gets, if you think about how a controller works, it's this like, uh, hold on, where did my thing there it is. If you think about how a controller works, like the code of it, well, it's, let's do some code thing. Um, at app dot route and slash venues, right? This is, this is responding to a get request, right? You go to, uh, localhost 
colon 5000 slash venue. This makes a get request, right? It sees this and then its whole job is to then, you know, go to the database, blah, blah. But ultimately, what does it throw over the wall? Like, what does it return? Some JSON, right? Or a list of venue dictionaries, something like that, right? So it does this by, you know, cursor. And we could just do like find all, right? The venue object and pass through the cursor. And these are our venues. And then, you know, for venue in venues, venue dot to JSON, if that method exists. Right? But what is this whole thing about? Like, so, like, this is a nice trick. It's like to think about what a method is about or what, like, a whole file is about. What's the input? What's the output? Right? Just like the same way of, like, writing our tests. Right? The, the tests, like, explain to us the goal. Like, what's important? How do we know this thing's passing that is doing its job? It's the same. It's like, and how do we write tests? Like, we start by thinking, what's the input? What's the output? In this case, the input is, like, a request. A request to slash venues. What's the output? The re obviously, you know, the return value is always the output, generally. Um, there are some exceptions, but generally the return value is really what you look at. And yeah, what, you know, what does this do? Well, it sends us back JSON. So it takes in a request, sends back a response. Every method in the controller does that, right? That's really what it's about. So just like anyway, when you think about controller, just think requests and responses, because that's that's complicated enough. So um, yeah, that that's what it accomplishes. The model we talked about, yeah, the model is the exact same thing that we talked about. And then here, I kind of did this already. I drew this out. So this is like you know an external API. Uh, to the client makes a request to the external API. It gets back JSON, right? We coerce the data, maybe save it, right? Turn it into an instance and, and then call the save method to save it in the database. And we can do that, like think, just think we can do this like overnight or like once a week, we can make requests to our APIs, right? And, and fill our database with information. Then during the day, the point is like at, these things are fairly independent. That then later on the user comes by, and he's like, "I want to get some information from your database, right? Like you loaded in data about venues from Yelp and Foursquare, and you cleaned this data and did all this work to make it easy, like hopefully to like tell me what I need to know about where to go eat or something like that, like better than Foursquare and Yelp because you combined all this data. So now I want to access this information." So it makes a request, get request to localhost 5000, right? It's going to be the URL, ourwebsite.com slash venues. The controller sees the get request to slash venues, and it calls, you know, this method, find all, converts it into the, you know, the JSON that we want and sends it back as a response, right? To the browser or to the client, to, to whoever's making the request. Right. So one thing you can see about this, it's like what is tying to get like these th these two components are fairly unrelated, which is a good thing, right? Like we can kind of make a request or sorry, pull our data in, do this at one point in time, and nothing is and the only thing kind of related to now our website. Right. This is adapter patterns all about pulling data into our database. The MVC part is all about responding to clients requests, right, to get our data. The only thing that they share in common is the data layer, which kind of makes sense, you know, model and the actual database itself. So that feels right. Like it, it's nice that these things are totally independent because we could just have like maybe like the data engineers work on the adapter pattern and maybe we have like the website engineers work on you know mvc stuff 
and they don't, you know, we can have two separate teams and they don't have to mess up each other's code and it already makes it easier to manage if we can essentially separate these code bases out, right? And and have people just focus on what they need. So let me, I'll, you know, I'll share this with you. I don't know how great it is, but, um, but it probably is worth reading through it, you know. I'd say, like, if you, it's good to do this stuff. Like, you know, I used to like, like trying to do like some creative writing stuff and what you see at least what i would see is like your creative writing is weak mine was pretty weak but then you would read a short story and you're like okay <laughs> like i think i'm trying to do what this guy's trying to do but why you start asking yourself like why is mine not living up to it and it really starts changing the way you read other people's work so if you, my point is if you just like kind of read this okay that will like help a little bit maybe probably not too much but if you write it down and then you're like, okay, well, maybe this doesn't sound as good as what we talked about in class or on Wikipedia or some book I read, you start realizing the difference between what you're writing down and what you're reading somebody else. And, it re and picking up those little differences is kind of like where I, how I improve, at least. I can just speak from personal experience, you know, like me, tr once you start trying to explain it. it's one thing to read it but once you start trying to write it that helps the way like the detail with which you'll start reading things and appreciating kind of like the difference between what you're writing down and what another author is writing down like i do this all the time when i you know i write curriculum and then i read other people's stuff all the time read books etc and obviously like part of that process is seeing the difference between what i'm writing and say what like sandy metz is writing and being like okay what well, how is she doing stuff differently Okay, so questions about, you know, like, this is really valuable too, like just being able to draw this out, because this is a lot of the times the way engineers communicate. And, you know, also like after our students get hired, they frequently, like I've had I've probably at least three students talk about just like how valuable this stuff is, like just drawing, communicating sketches, right? You're communicating concepts to other engineers. And also you're ensuring you, you yourself understand it. I'm going to try to work this more and more into the co course, just like explaining things. I have some curriculum that we delayed until after the course, you know, like, you know, talking through interviews or whatever. But I'm going to try to front load that a little bit more and hopefully we'll practice it more. Um, I think it's very, you know, more and more I'm appreciating how valuable this is for graduates. Okay, um, give me one second. Hey, sorry about that. All right, so the next thing um, I just wanted to prep you a little bit for the lab. I think you all are in pretty good shape. Like this, these review questions were supposed to be uh, like prep for that. But here's the main thing I think I wanted to talk about, which is like, all right, you'll work through the lab. There's a reading. Essentially what the lab is, is if you think about what we've done so far, We've been just loading the data, pulling data from an API, loading it into one model, right? Like, you know, creating a venue, creating venue instances, loading it into the venue table. So what we'll be doing now is still hitting the Foursquare API, but now this will be the venue adapter, right? Maybe we already built that in the last lesson. And now we'll have another one. So this will be like our categories, right? A venue has many categories. 
And if you think about it, we're going to need to take data from the client, coerce, just select now what's relevant to categories, and load that into a category model. Right? Turn that into category. This is venue. So each. So this is, you know, we only need one client for each API, but probably we need a transformer or a adapter for each model that we want to like this thing is in charge of taking the dictionary transforming it into a venue this thing is in charge of taking the dictionary trans taking the relevant stuff about a category right and then obviously you know we load into a separate table so that's kind of that's essentially the next step and what this lab is about is now employing this with a couple different uh, models and then yeah, what I want, the only like kind of tip I had, because I feel like it's very easy just to like run the tests. So if you run this, the tests, I'll just give you an example. So I, this is the solution, right? I, I have the solution. So I, I did this, but I left one breaking test. So we have one breaking test. We can look at it, right? It's um, test restaurant index. Maybe we can click on it and go to the relevant thing. It's like, okay, client get venues. JSON loads some sort of response data, and we get the JSON response. You know, it should have maybe two entities that come back. The first one is Famiglia, the second one is Cafe Mogador. So now you like read, you know, what do I always say? Like, read the error message. I don't know. Like, this error message doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, like, we can look through it. Uh, Anaconda, something like that doesn't, that's not related to us. Uh, it just says the internal server here was unable to complete our request. It doesn't tell us why. It says there's an error in the application. Something about raw decode. This is inside the Python 3.9 library. That probably isn't super relevant to us. Um, and actually, there I did just see the error message. But I think it's a little bit easier. So the error message, you can see it right here. So finally, we can see it here. And this is a little bit helpful. But another way of doing this is just to load up uh, run.py and then go to write slash venues. And, see, and now, like, here's the error message like right in front of us. Object of type decimal is not serializable. Here's another way we can see it even better is right here. And, and, we, and now I can finally see here's the line that it's breaking on, right? Backend API init.py line 24. So when I, again, just to review, when I'm reading the error messages, you're looking for your part, your code base, and ignoring things that are not part of your code base. So this is inside site packages. We did not tuck, touch the code in the Flask library, right? We touched our code. So we can ignore all this stuff and ignore all this stuff, this is all inside packages, site packages, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, we see something related to our code. Sometimes what people will do to like really, is you'll just press Command F, and then you'll search for, right, like your folder, right? Or like Foursquare, the name of the lab, right? Just because we, now it's focused in on the code that you wrote, right, and highlighting that line. So we can see API init.py line 24. Again, we can like just click on that, honestly. Now we're going to line 24, and then we see that it's taking us right here, and then we'll read the error message. Object of type JSON is not serializable. So the issue is probably that this response is sending back, uh, you know, like a decimal, right? Like maybe it's a, we have a venue, and the rating is like 7.3, but it doesn't know how to transform a decimal, so we need to convert it to a string. So we can add this argument default equals string. But the point, the point is not the fix, like isn't this part. The point is reading the error message and just using another perspective to read the error message. So if you, you know, run the load up the server and hit it, make request to slash venues that way, then you can maybe get a better sense of what the error message is. You can open up the terminal and see it that way and focus in on it. 
and it might be a little bit easier to figure out, you know, we, we always want to do that. What's the problem before employing a fix, right? Don't just like start fixing the car before understanding what's wrong with it. And that just like, again, improving a process, like this is about ETL and object orientation, and but this is really about working with a large code base and how to carefully move through a process. And that if you employ that process, regardless of what you're coding, you can always just lean on that process to get you through. That is like the beauty, all right? That to me, that's like an engineer. We don't understand what's going on, but somehow we will like lean on a process to figure it out, okay? Because the code base is a million lines long. So you're gonna find a bug in one part of it that you've never seen before, don't understand it, and you just lean on the process to solve the issue, okay? Um, all right, and then we refresh and now it works. Okay, so to fix this particular bug, it was just, okay, this default equals string, but we didn't know that until we saw, like we're able to figure out the error message of JSON type is not serializable. If we didn't know how to fix, we can, now that we see the error message, we can always put it into Google and, right, it tells us exactly, right, what to do. But again, we can't do that unless we identify the error message. Once we do that, things become a bit easier. Okay, questions before. So I'll show you where I'm going to deploy this uh, lab, this four square multiple models lab. All right. You feel free to work in Paris with it if you want. That's fine.